Hello, my friends. This is Pastor Christopher Alam at home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I greet you and your family in the name of Jesus, and I trust you are doing well wherever in the world you are. We have people watching these lessons from all over the world, and wherever you are, I just want you to know that the hand of the Lord is upon you and you are going to do well, no matter what the circumstances are in the world around us. If you stay in faith and trust in his word, the Lord will always move in your life and you shall experience his blessings in the midst of difficult situations. Today, we are going to start with a new subject and that is the power of the blood of Jesus. So we are going to talk about the power of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing I want to say to you is that the blood of Jesus is pure and holy. That's what makes it, it uh, different from the blood of any other human being. Because you see, the reason uh, why the blood of Jesus is pure and holy is this, it's because of the virgin birth. Now let me explain this to you and I, ex I had explained this in another subject but uh, for those of you who didn't hear my other teachings I just want to bring it back to you again. You see when God created Adam, God created Adam pure and holy and without sin. So God created Adam out of the dust of the earth and then the Bible says that Adam, you know at that time Adam was created of the dust of the earth and he was just a shell, a form of a human being. But God breathed into, life, into his, his own breath, his own life. And that is how Adam became a living being. What made Adam a living being was the breath of God. And that word breath uh, in, in the Hebrew is ruach. In Arabic, it's similar incidentally, it's ruh, which actually means spirit. So when God you know, the, the word for breath and the word for spirit are the same word. So what happened was that when, when, when God created Adam, God, God picked up this shell that he had created and he breathed into it his own spirit. And that shell became a living being and that was Adam. So Adam uh, had the life of God in him. And so in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when God created Adam, you can say that the life of God that made Adam a living being uh, went into Adam's bloodstream because life is in the blood. So Adam's blood was pure because the life of God was in it, right? So he was the first human being. And if you remember God, when he created Adam, this is what he said before he created Adam. He said, let us create man in our image, in our likeness. So God created Adam in his own image, in his own likeness. In other words, just as God was pure and holy and perfect, um, Adam was also created pure and holy and perfect. So his blood was pure. So what happened was that when Adam and Eve, his wife Eve, they fell into sin. Uh, but, he, but here's the thing. There's one thing. Because God created Adam in his own image, God also made Adam a sovereign being with his own ability to choose. Adam had the right to choose between right or, or wrong. Because if God had not created Adam with the right of choice, then Adam wouldn't be in the image of God. It is because he was created in the image and the likeness of God that God made him a sovereign being with the right to choose. So Adam and Eve, they made the wrong choice. They chose to believe what Satan said instead of what God said. And when that happened, sin entered into Adam and this sin entered into his bloodstream. So you can say, as somebody once said, that when Adam fell into sin, that was the first case of blood poisoning. His sin, his, I mean, his sin tainted his blood. His blood was tainted by sin. And since that time, <coughs> what has happened is that every human being who's born into this earth carries, uh, you know, uh, carries the DNA of his father. So what happens is that, is that this sin, the, uh, the inherent sin 
of man it actually has its roots from adam the sin of adam has been passed down through the bloodstream uh, to every single human being who is uh, a progeny or you know offspring of adam and that includes me and you who are watching this we were all born into this sin and we were all born with blood that was tainted with sin that's why david said he says, in sin was I born and in sin did my mother conceive me. So sin isn't really, uh, isn't primarily what a person does. When we use the word sin, we think of the wrong things that people do. No, sin isn't primarily the wrong things that people do, but sin are really what a person is in his nature. It's a part of our nature. It's deeper than just the acts. Uh, that are sinful, but it's a part of our nature. And what happens is that because of that sin nature, we sin. We sin because of that sin nature. So Adam and Eve, they passed their sin on through the generations. And so what happened was that then we go into, you know, we go into the Old Testament and then we see that there was this concept we read about in the Bible of the, uh, of, um, how do you say, an innocent animal had to die, uh, had to, who's had to shed, you know, his blood has had to be shed to cover the sins of guilty people. And you see this principle in all religions, every single religion on this world, there's always that concept of blood sacrifice. And it's normally, you know, some, some religions, they even sacrifice human beings. Uh, but that, that's more in the past, in history. Now, you know, they sacrifice animals. They sacrifice animals. And in the Old Testament, we read about how, uh, how those lambs, those goats, those sheep were slaughtered in the temple. And the blood was sprinkled on the altar. And those sacrificial animals were, were, were offered unto God to make an atonement for the sin, uh, you know, for the sins of the people. And so uh, every year, every year, uh, these animals would be sacrificed to pay for the sins of the people. That's what it was. So you find this in every single religion in this world. There is always a concept of uh, the blood of innocent animals being shed for the sins of mankind. So you, you know, you have that uh, concept. So that is why God wanted to make a, a sacrifice that was once for all. And, and, and the reason why animal sacrifices, now we are talking about the Bible, we are not talking about other religions. Why, uh, why uh, you know, the sacrifice of animals wasn't good enough. Well, it wasn't good enough because these animals had to be offered year by year. Every year they had to be made to be made an atonement for sin. But God wanted to provide a perfect sacrifice on this earth who would die for the sins of mankind, whose blood would be pure. So now what happened? I want you to look back, you know, at this thing with animals. Whenever a sacrificial animal had to be sacrificed, it had to be uh, pure, without any blemish, without any mark. An animal that was blind wouldn't be accepted or had one horn broken or a leg that was broken wasn't good enough. It had to be a pure, perfect uh, animal without any blemish. Only that was good enough to be sacrificed to atone for the sins of the sinner. So uh, because it was always an unblemished, perfect animal that, to die, that had to die for the sins of, of, of men, uh, for the sins of the people on whose behalf that animal was being offered. So God wanted to make a sacrifice that would be pure and holy and unblemished. And secondly, it, it would be for posterity, not just, you know, once a year, uh, because that wouldn't be good enough. God wanted to make to, uh, to you know, a sacrifice that would be perfect. And that is why Jesus came into this world. He came into this world to die for the sins of man. And he knew it. He knew that. And he mentions it several times in, in the Gospels, how he would be crucified. And Jesus had to be that perfect sacrifice with, uh, you know, who was without blemish. And 
So that would mean in his case, he had to be without sin and he had to be without, uh, you know, in, in other words, he had to be a, a human being so that he could fully represent human beings uh, upon the altar of sacrifice, which was the cross of Calvary. And plus he had to be one whose blood was unblemished and untainted by sin. And that is where the, uh, the wonderful truth of the virgin birth comes in. Because here's one thing, you, know, you see, when a, when a woman conceives, when, uh, when, the, when a man and a woman come together and the sperm of the male, uh, it, it, it fertilizes the egg, egg of the female, you know, forgive me for being so blunt, but I want you to understand this point. So if I'm a bit blunt, I ask your uh, forgiveness, but I'm trying to explain this point to you that when the sperm of a man comes together with the egg of a woman, so what happens and the fetus begins to develop in the womb of the mother, uh, you know, and that, that fetus is actually what they call a fetus is the early stages of a baby. The fetus is the word used for it, but it's actually a baby. And that baby, little bit baby, that baby begins to grow. Now what happens until the point that the, that the baby is delivered, um, the, the baby, uh, now this is a medical fact, the baby gets all kinds of nutrition. It gets oxygen. It needs, it gets everything it needs to survive from its mother through the umbilical cord, you know, the umbilical cord that connects the, the uh, you know, from the navel of the baby to the mother. Through that cord, the baby gets all, everything it needs from its mother. So it, so you can say a baby gets its body from its mother, but not one single drop of blood passes from the mother to the child and the blood is developed inside the body itself. So when Jesus was in the womb of Mary, he did not get one single drop of blood from Mary. So his blood and the life in his blood, and you see how he was conceived was by the Holy Spirit, by the word of God. If you remember what the angel said to Gabriel, he says that he says that the, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall conceive and you shall have a baby. So, and he shall be called the son of God. Why was he the son of God? Well, because he wasn't the son of Adam. He was the son of God because uh, he, he got his humanity from Mary, but his life was straight from the father. He was the word that became flesh and he walked on this earth and we saw his glory. In fact, Jesus wasn't really born in Bethlehem. You can say uh, realistically, he was actually uh, reincarnated in Bethlehem. That is when God, who has always been there, came to this earth into the womb of a, of a girl called Mary and he took upon himself a, you know, he took upon himself human flesh. And so you can say that the almighty God upon his throne, he came to this earth and he, he took off his robe of divine glory and he took upon himself, he put upon himself a robe made of the dust of the earth, of human flesh. And for nine months, he grew inside the womb of a mother and he got his physical body from his mother that was Mary, but his blood, he didn't get a drop of blood from Adam or from the sons of Adam. The life that was in his blood was from God. And so when he was born, he was born pure and perfect and holy. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus was pure and perfect and holy. And that's why, he, he, you know, he's also referred to as the second Adam eh, because, because, uh, he, uh, uh, just like Adam was created perfect. If you notice, Adam was not born, he was created. But when Adam first walked on the earth before he sinned, he sinned, he was perfect. In the same, in the same way, Jesus, who is the second Adam, is actually the second man walking on this earth who is perfect. So he walked on this earth as a perfect man and his blood was perfect. And from 
The time he came to this earth, the devil tried to destroy him. First, it was Herod who wanted to kill him, who ended up killing all the babies in Bethlehem under the age of two. And then, uh, and then Satan tempted him throughout his life. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way that any man can ever be tempted, but without sin, because the devil wanted to do the same thing to him as he did to Adam. But Jesus resisted temptation. At times the temptations were so hard and the Bible tells us that there were times he would cry out unto the Father with loud cries and tears to the one who <coughs> to the one who could save him from death. So Jesus subjected himself to the same things that you and I are subjected to. He went through the same temptations that you and I are tempted with, but he kept his blood pure. He was holy. He was untainted. He was without sin of any kind. He, after Adam, he was the only human being who walked on this earth but without sin. Now, the, another difference between him and Adam was that when Adam was tempted for the first time, Adam fell and he sinned, but Jesus was tempted again and again, and he never sinned. So when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, he went to the cross as a sacrificial lamb who shed his pure, holy blood that was without sin, that was untainted by the sin of Adam. And that was the only blood that was worthy, that could be shed for man and that could cleanse man from his sins once and forever. Hallelujah. And that is the wonderful thing about the salvation experience. And I was thinking this morning, I have been saved for 45 years. And let me tell you something, and I have been washed in the blood of Jesus. And, and uh, you know, I have, I have stumbled many times. I've made many mistakes like you, like anybody else. None of us is perfect, but the blood of Jesus is so powerful that it saves us. It gives us life. Hallelujah. So we're going to talk about this now, but that was my first point. I want you to understand when we say that the blood of Jesus is pure and holy, why is the blood of Jesus pure and holy? What, what, how, why is not the blood of all these other prophets pure and holy? They were also men of God. Why is the blood of Jesus pure and holy? Well, it was pure and holy because a, Jesus was born of a virgin and his blood was untainted by the sin of Adam. It was unblemished by the sin of Adam. And uh, there was none of Adam's nature or sin in the blood of Jesus. His blood was perfect. Hallelujah. So uh, let me give you the first scripture I want to share with you. First Peter 1 verses 18 to 19. And these are the words of the apostle Peter. And this is like, this is what he writes. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So it says that we were not redeemed with corruptible things. Corruptible things are things that can, uh, that can be uh, tarnished with age. You know, cor corruptible things are things that can rot, things that can spoil, things that can be tarnished, and those are corruptible things. Corruptible things are the things in this world. You buy some fresh vegetables, you keep it out there, after a few days it begins to rot. Doesn't matter how nice it looks when you buy it. You buy a piece of meat, and even if you keep it in the fridge, after a few days it will begin to rot. You keep it in the freezer, and after a few months it will develop freezer burn. It will be inedible. So everything in this world uh, is uh, is under corruption and corruption here in biblical language it means things that can rot that can spoil it says so you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold even silver and gold can lose their tarnish you polish it up keep it out there look at it after a week suddenly it's not shiny anymore that's you know uh, everything can be corrupted and he says but so we were not bought with things that can uh, that can that can be tarnished, things that can that can rot, things that can spoil. But 
we were bought with the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. So first thing I see here that the blood of Jesus is incorruptible in the sense that the blood of Jesus, it cannot rot, it cannot spoil. Now that is unique because you see, I like to use this example. If I take a little uh, razor blade or a knife and make a little incision and cut here, and I let a couple of drops of my blood drop uh, on this table or on the floor, what will happen if you come back tomorrow morning, all you will see is a dark spot here. Why? Because my blood is corruptible. It is, it is dried up. It is not, you know, what it was when it first came. But the blood of Jesus is incorruptible. It contains the life of God. So because of that, the blood of Jesus, listen to this, because it is incorruptible, the blood of Jesus is as fresh, it is as warm, it is as pure, as life-giving today as it was 2,000 years ago. If I could get a physical drop of the blood and put it on this table, even after five years, <coughs> it would still look the same because it is, it cannot be tarnished. It cannot dry up. It is as, it flows as fresh, as warm today, as full of life today, as it was when it rained down, when it flowed down the cross of Calvary 2000 years ago. And that is why the blood of Jesus can still cleanse sinners even today, 2000 years after it was shed upon the cross, it can still heal the sick. It can still break curses upon your life. It can still deliver people from the works of Satan. It can still infuse life today as it gave, as it did 2000 years ago. Thank you, Jesus. So it says, it says, we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, you know. And so we were redeemed from traditions of our fathers, you know, traditional religions. And uh, I didn't grow up as a Christian. I grew up in, in another religion and I grew up the way I grew up. If you ask me why did I belong to that religion, I didn't have a choice. I grew up in it because that's what my parents believed. And, and that's the way it was. And that's the way it is. But the blood of Jesus redeems us out of what we were born into. And it gives us new life. And we were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is precious. The blood of Jesus is priceless because it can cleanse the lives of all mankind, the seven Point, I don't know how many billion people on this earth, but the blood of Jesus is so life-giving. It can cleanse from sin. It can deliver from disease and set free every one of those seven billion plus human beings on this earth. That is why it is, it is so powerful and it is precious and it is holy and it is still life-giving today. It is like of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And that also tells us that Jesus was without blemish and without spot. Hallelujah. What a wonderful Savior that we have. Amen. So the, remember this, that the blood of Jesus eternal, is eternal and it doesn't, uh, how do you say, fade or tarnish or spoil or rot or dry up with time. It is holy blood. It is pure blood. It is precious blood. It is untainted by the sin of Adam's Adam. It still carries the life of God today. And it is as fresh and warm today as it was 2000 years ago. And it is precious and it is holy. Hallelujah. And that is what we are going to study about uh, these few days. So let us, let me, let us stop here right now because uh, I, I don't want to launch into the next point and then just stop after a few sentences. What I will do, I will stop right here and then we will continue on with that tomorrow if that's okay with you. So this session is a few minutes shorter, but it's okay. We will, we will continue on with the subject tomorrow, but let us pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters who can hear my voice. 
I ask you to touch their lives and bless them these days, Father. I ask you to cause them to prosper and to be blessed in all things in their lives, in their spiritual lives, materially, Father, meet all their needs in the name of Jesus. I ask you to do mighty things in their lives, in their families. Let there be healing and miracles from every sickness and disease and infirmity in their lives, Father, in their bodies, in their minds. And I ask you to continue to touch us through your word and cause us to grow and to increase and abound in our faith. In the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. <coughs> in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, and I'll be seeing you tomorrow.